Thank you, Mike, for having me back. Mike always, y'all don't realize this, I know hundreds of meeting planners. I do, I like doing Mike's shows because Mike's pretty much the most organized, best meeting planner out there. And like I said, I know hundreds. So while he's in the frickin' room, give him a hand. He's, <clears throat> he and Mike McCarthy, of course. Anyway, as a rejoinder to what, what was this fellow's name last night? Bill Thomas? Did y'all see the Wall Street Journal this morning? Anybody read it yet? Well, they, this was the article, and I just grabbed a few slides from it just to kind of, not just to refute, but just to show kind of maybe a different point of view on what he was saying to age wealth, change how you feel about changing. And it turns out that people, um, aging is typically associated with declines, but, but people who are younger having supportive relationships and love in your life and community and all that, it turns out older folks, and I'm going to go ahead and call them elders because I'm too used to calling them elders not to, and I kind of am one now, are actually way happier than we think they are, all right? And I, I tell people part of it, at least for me, is I'm in my 50s now. <clears throat> when you're in your 50s, you are who you are going to be. Everything else is stripped away, and this is you, and you wind up getting the value of time and only doing things you want to do. So really, people, people that the problems that we think that people have when they're older, really, I encourage you to read this article today because older folks are more, are more sort of chilled out than we think they are. It's a great, great article just out today. And, and in fact, I stuck Pablo Casals in there just as kind of a, an example of this because Pablo Casals was the greatest cellist in the 20th century and an optimist too. He got he married a I think a twenty five year old when he was seventy, but he uh, but he kept practicing and even when he was ninety four years old he would practice four hours a day. And somebody asked him, they said, "Look, you've done everything. You're ninety four years old. You have nothing left to prove. Why are you still practicing four hours a day?" And he's like, "You know, I'm beginning to notice some improvement." <laughs> Love that guy. Anyway, how many of y'all have seen this movie? Please tell me you've seen this movie. I did an audience of 29-year-olds the other day, and nobody had seen this movie, and I was like, well, there goes that speech. But anyway, this was really the first. This is my favorite movie, and this is really an example of ambient intelligence. Okay, you have the ship. Think of the ship as their spaceship, or you can think of it as a hospital, or you can think of it as an assisted living center, all right? It's an environment. And Hal, y'all remember Hal, I'm, you know, Dave, I'm afraid I can't open those doors, Hal. Hal took all the sensory input on the ship and ran the ship for them and took care of the astronauts on there. Did any of y'all know how Hal got his name, by the way? It's the Caesar Cipher. It's one less than IBM. So, yeah, that's, it was kind of an in-joke in there. Anyway, there's Hal kind of keeping an eye on everything, making sure all the astronauts are okay taking care of everybody. That is an example of ambient intelligence, which I'm going to explain a lot further. Hal took care of Pierre Dulay, who would watch all the inputs. He took care, there were actually extra passengers on the spaceship, which you never saw because, well, Hal killed them. So, you know, you never really saw them. Uh, this is kind of a funny slide because this movie's 50 years old and the guy's watching the news on a device that looks suspiciously like a what? Uh-huh. In fact, when Apple sued Samsung for um, patent infringement on the iPad, Samsung said that Apple stole it from 2001 A Space Odyssey. That was their defense. All right. Anyway, so there's all these inputs on the ship that Hal in the middle kind of kept an eye on. You know, he watched everybody's health, told them when to nap, told them when to do things. He was able to read their lips. It's Gary Lockwood on the left and Kier Dulay on the right. He was able to read their lips. Everything is about data. Everything's all about data. Healthcare is turning into everything all about data now. And it's doing so in a black swan fashion. And I'm sure you all have heard about black swan events. A black swan event is something that kind of comes out of nowhere and changes everything. And data is doing that in businesses. Netflix black swan too. <coughs> blockbuster in a big way. Everybody, National Geographic said, oh, it's the end of cheap oil. We'll never have cheap oil again. And the Energy Administration, Energy International Administration said, 
a year and a half ago with a 95% confidence level, there was no way that oil was going to go down below uh, $60, and it was probably going to stay at $100. And uh, we all know how that turned out, all right? Things can happen that we don't think are going to happen. Fracking came out of nowhere. People didn't think that would ever work. It's changed us into a net energy exporter. If any of y'all are in the investment advisory business, rut row because robo-advisors are going to take fees down to 10 basis points, and that's not going to be the business that it used to be. It's, it's going to manage portfolios way cheaper than they used to be. Elon Musk is black swanning us in cars with batteries going to the moon. By the way, y'all know how many moving parts are in a Tesla? Six moving parts in a Tesla car. Isn't that amazing? Two are in the driving wheel, uh, the steering wheel, uh, brake pads, and then the engine. Six moving parts in a car. Uber has black swan too. Yeah, they don't like him too much, especially in France where they're tipping cars over and doing all kinds of stuff. Amazon's black swanning everybody, especially in the data business now. Um, in fact, if you're watching a Netflix movie, you're watching it streamed from Amazon. The Beatles were responsible for one of the larger black swans in healthcare. They were making, so that's, that's right before they crossed the road, by the way, before they crossed Abbey Road. I just love that picture. They were making so much money for EMI, electronics and medical instruments, that EMI didn't even know how to spend it. And this guy named Jeffrey Godfrey Hounsfield, that's a name for the ladies, said, uh, you know, I was watching these beavers eating this bark around this tree, and if y'all gave me some of that Beatles money, I think I might be able to do something with it. And they just threw some money at him, and three years later, he came out with a CT machine, all right, the CT scanner. So it may be the real reason for the Beatles in the big arc of history was to advent and save lives with a CT scanner. Sort of like George Carlin used to say, the real reason that humans are on the planet is because the Earth wanted plastic. You never know. Anyway, the big black swan that's going on now is businesses, including assisted living centers and hospitals, are turning into data businesses. Uh, insurance turned into a data business in the 50s with 600 megabytes worth of data. American Airlines changed the reservation system with 800 megabytes of data. FedEx, 80 gigabytes of data. And by the way, by studying data, what does UPS never do? What will you see a UPS driver never do? Exactly, they won't take left turns because they've studied the data and it's not efficient. Citicorp installed the ATM system, 450 gigabytes of data. Walmart, who I talk about all the time, I made a movie about them, changed retailing uh, with data. I'm not gonna go heavily into Walmart because sometimes I just get too into it. It's sort of an obsession with me. And, and in fact, the, the genesis of what I'm talking to you all about is a research paper I'm writing for some people, and so I'm sort of thinking this out in my head as I talk to you all. Facebook, with 100 petabytes of data, changed things. But what we're here to talk about is ambient intelligence, this strange word that is sort of derived from artificial intelligence. Ambient intelligence is an intel intelligent computing where the environments support the people inhabiting the environments, like the astronauts on the spaceship that Hal was following, right? This is the long definition, but basically what it says, it's aware of people's presence and context and it adapts to their behavior and helps them if it can. That's ambient intelligence. It, ambient intelligence gathers information from lots of places, gives it context and acts on it, and its origin comes from the Latin something, which means to weave together. I'm not very good at Latin. I went to Georgia Tech. We don't really study that sort of thing there. Anyway, like how ambient intelligence takes information and gives it context. All right, I'm going to shift a second. I don't really think y'all appreciate how much, how many customers y'all are going to have, how many residents you're going to have. People are going to live longer than they think they're going to live. And that's going to require help. This is an Atlantic article. What happens when we all live to be 100? Don't laugh. It's going to happen. Uh, in Japan, next year, they're going to sell more adult diapers than baby diapers because nobody's having babies and people are living so daggum long. All right? Uh, in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, you talked about how they used to give silver bowls to people that lived to be 100. And uh, now they just give them this little cheap imitation because so, so many people are doing it. In 63, Japan had 153 
centenarians, and now 30,000 Japanese turn 100 every year. All right, the longevity line is turning up like this. It used to go like this. It's turning up like this now. In 2050, there'll be 680,000 centenarians in Japan, which is a hard word to spell. I kept spelling it wrong. In Japan. This is a friend of my dad's. My dad was a physician. A friend of my dad's, a friend of mine named Curly Watson, he practiced medicine until he was 103. Then he fell over and died. All right? He birthed 46,000 babies. That's a full life, all right? But I think you're going to be seeing more and more people living longer and longer, being active longer and longer. These were lifespans in the year 1900. I'm sure if y'all, some, some of y'all have seen this. This is ripped off from Hans Rosling. That's China. That's America. This is 1900. That's income. And this is life expectancy. Look how much things have changed in 100 years. In areas like China, they've almost tripled. All right, and because of medical science, it's going faster and faster. This is from 1800 in the United States up until now. We went from an average lifespan of 40 up to 80, and it's going to go larger than that. The little blips you see in there are wars, World War I, Civil War, that sort of thing. All right, you combine this with a total fertility rate that is collapsing. People are having less babies. You hear all these Malthusian comments about overpopulation well the only place that's going to be overpopulated a growing population is Africa where they're going to go to in 2100 they're going from about 700 million people now to about a billion and a half all right they're going to grow everywhere else fertility is collapsing in Eastern Europe 120 million to 60 million in China collapsing from 1.4 it's going to peak down to about 800 million in 2100 and by the way, 200 million of those are going, 200 million of those males are going to Africa because they're running out of resources. Why do you think the Chinese are so interested in Africa? Because they're going to ship about a tenth of their population over there or an eighth of their population over there. Strange things are going on. I went and took a look at, just for fun, this is the Iranian fertility rate, children per women. Uh, in 1962, the year I was born, was about 7, all right? Now it's 1.7. In my lifetime, fertility rate has crashed from 7 to 1.7 in Iran. And if you want to know what's really going on in Iran right now, they're having an existential demographic crisis. That's really what's going on there. Demography is changing faster than, pe than people think, and we're running out of Italians. Please, I love Italy. Italians, get on it. Breed. Make condoms illegal. Show porn 24-7. Get people on it. Let's go. Um, this takes that to 2,300. These are um, UN figures. And what's funny is if you take basically what our fertility rate is now, which is about a 1.7 fertility rate. Uh, let's go to my next one. In the year 2300, we wind up with a population of about 3 billion people. Everybody's worried about overpopulation, but at our current fertility rate, it's going to be about 3 billion, but here's the freaky-deaky part of that. The percentage of the population kept at 1.7 fertility rate in the year 2300, over 40% of the population is going to be over 80. All right? People are getting older than we think they are. That's sort of good for y'all's business. People don't appreciate how long people are living now, over 40%. Uh, Macau and Japan are sort of leading it. The United States is right behind. Uh, in 2011, 11% of the population of the world was over the age of 60. In 2050, that's going to double to 22%. All right, this is happening soon. The number of people 80 and older will quadruple by the time it's 2050. And here's what's was good and interesting to me. Never before have the majority of middle-aged adults had living parents in human history. And that's what we're living through. And I think that's kind of a cool thing. I mean, don't y'all? I think it's kind of neat that we have older parents around. The number of centenarians that we could count um, in the United States in the 1950s, well, I'll use the low number, is 2,300. In 2050, we're looking at 834,000 that are going to live to be 100 years old, all right? Ladies, it's going to be you, all right? You deserve it for putting up 
with us all those years. We are kind of giant pains in the butt. And for ladies, this applies to ladies, not men. A year from now, because of increases in longevity and life expectancy, driven mostly by technology, you're going to have three months that you don't have right now. All right? That's how fast things are changing, and people don't appreciate it because medical knowledge is doubling quick, quickly. It took, from 1750, it took 150 years for medical knowledge to double. In 2020, it's going to be doubling every 73 days. There's too much knowledge coming in. If you're a phlebotomist and you're trying to keep up with the current literature and phlebotomy, phlebotomy, um, you would spend 17 hours a day doing nothing but reading. All right, there's too much data and information coming in for people themselves to kind of handle it. We've got an exponential growth of medical knowledge and computing power that can finally handle it now. The art of medicine, as my dad practiced it, is turning into the science of medicine because we're collecting more data from EMRs, which are driving hospitals crazy because we just went from ICD-9 to ICD-10, and we went from 14,000 ways to classify ailments to 70,000, yeah, I think. And we've got new codes, so there's a code for everything now. <laughs> Subsequent encounter after being sucked into a jet engine is a code, is a medical code. Problem with in-laws <laughs> is a universal medical code. Other contact with Cal, subsequent encounter. Um, and at the same time, we're running out of doctors. By 2025, we're going to be short 125,000 doctors, all right? PAs and NPs are kind of going to make up, um, make, make those things up. But y'all are, too, being helped out by data. Data is going to be helping us out. A lot of it is genetic data because you're going to be able to identify things before they happen. I have my genome run. I'm adopted. And so when I go to the doctor, they say, what's your family history of cancer? Or what's your family history of heart disease, Ron? And I'm like, I don't know. Put yours down. It's a small town. Might work. Statistically, never know. But now I know that I have Scandinavian blood, all right? I know that, unfortunately, I'm related to Bono, all right? I know that my chances for prostate cancer are 30-something percent higher than the average male because they've taken my DNA and crowdsourced it against other people's DNA and made inferences about what's probably going to happen to me. I know that I'm at a higher risk for colorectal cancer. This is exactly what Angelina Jolie did when she decided to have a double mastectomy, by the way. You're preventing, you're preventing disease before it starts. I love vodka martinis, and they make great ones here, and I'm at a very low risk for type 2 diabetes. Got to love that. This is a patient safety issue, all right? I know when I go into a hospital, I have an increased sensitivity to Coumadin. I'm glad I know that before I go into the hospital, right? That's something that's a good thing to know. Um, there's give you all kinds of information. Let me show you something that's not so good to put on your Match.com profile. My earwax type <laughs> is wet. The kind of ladies that go for that are the ones I really want to go out with, actually. So, you know, what can I say? But pretty much everything they predict about me is true, all right? I'm a fast caffeine metabolizer, and here's my favorite genotype. I know that increasing energy intake, decreasing energy intake, which is dieting, all right, and increasing physical activity, which is exercise, is not in my genotype associated with weight loss. Hell yeah. <laughs> I call that the free pass gene, you know. I can just do what I want. And uh, here's another little match.com thing. I'm at a very decreased risk for schizophrenia. But you learn all these amazing things. I know what my chances are for Alzheimer's. My adopted father had Alzheimer's, and I know I have a very low chance for Alzheimer's, according to my genome. However, if I was a female, I would have a very high chance of Alzheimer's. All right? These are things that we're learning from data, all right? And we finally got things like Watson, which actually is as incredible as it sounds, 
which can read journals, read EMRs, and learn things about this data and apply it. It reads patient records, it reads medical literature, and it structures it because 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years and 80% of it is unstructured. Well, it's getting structured now because Watson and other supercomputers are able to assimilate so much information and infer things, make, make connections between things. There's even a uh, magazine, there's a journal, Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. My ex-wife is a breast cancer surgeon and she's been part of an experiment where they let AI read mammograms and she said they're 95% accurate. Don't be a radiologist. Don't let your kids be a radiologist. That field is not in, in good, uh, good stead. But here's how it happens. A physician queries Watson about a patient. Remember, we're running out of physicians, so this is added help. Uh, Watson parses the query. It takes the sentence you ask it like Google does, and it parses the query. It mines the electronic medical records, what medications they're on, and any family history that's available. It then consults medical journals, because there's all this knowledge coming out all the time, and it forms a hypothesis and assigns a confidence value to that. All right, that's where medicine is going now. Medicine is becoming completely data-driven, which is why if your kids do want to go into medicine, have them be nurse practitioners or physician's assistants, because they're going to be the ones using this kind of medicine to help patients, and it'll be fantastic careers, and you'll also be using this in assisted living centers. That's another article, and I can't even remember what I put in there. For some reason, I found that interesting. But you can do such wacky things with data. You can predict things. This is a patent that Amazon did, Method and System for Anticipatory Package Shipping. Boring. Jeff Bezos is on that patent somewhere, and it says blah, 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 anticipatory method packaging, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Here's what it does. Amazon ships you something before you order it. They know you that well. <laughs> it's a patent to do that. And what it does is it essentially ships it to the distribution center closest to you early, thinking that you'll probably order it. So when you do, it'll get it to you quicker. All right? And this is all driven by data. And by the way, you know who's going to be delivering you those same day packages from Amazon? Uber. Not kidding. That's how they're going to put Uber drivers. The Uber driver's downtime is going to start being used doing same-day delivery for Amazon. How weird is that? Pretty weird. And this all goes, this all, this all depends on the Internet of Things, which you've heard of, which means every device has an IP address and data can be gathered from it. All right? I'll give you an idea how weird I am. As I approach my house, when I'm within 100 yards of my house, my, my phone lets my house know where I am. And this is done through an IF. Have any of y'all done IFTTTs? Yeah. So it lets, it lets my house know that I'm close. It opens my garage door, unlocks the house, turns on my favorite playlist, and turns on the lights as I approach the house. All right? I don't do any of that. There are also people that take it a little bit too far like me, and I have those uh, GE lights that turn different colors, you know, the LED lights, they're like 50 bucks a light. And I wrote a script that attaches itself to ESPN, and every time uh, Georgia Tech plays, the lights in my house turn yellow. No shit. <laughs> I don't get out much. That's the Internet of Things, taking data from different places, combining it, all right, and using it in interesting ways. And, okay, one of the, one of the biggest places we're going to be gathering data from is something assembling or resembling the Magic Bands. How many of y'all have been to Disney and used the Magic Bands? They're freaking far out. Did you love it? I love those things. They've got RFID chips in there, and they send them to you before you go there. When you go to your hotel room, you just, as you approach your hotel room, your room unlocks. You use it to pay for things. You can go to a wall on a restaurant, outside a restaurant, pick what you want. It knows who you are. It pays for it right there. You can sit anywhere in the room, and they bring it right to you. They bring your food right to you. All right, and those are starting to pop up in hospitals now, or variations of those. You see them with babies now to prevent babies from being 
carried out of hospitals by people that ought not be carrying them out of hospitals. But I've said it before, your health and your money is going to wind up living on your risk. I do on your wrist. I wind up not even on your phone because, by the way, once you get a smartphone, when people get the Apple Watch, they find that they use their phone 60% less. All right? It's this where everything's going to live, and it's a huge, huge source of data. All right? And it's, that's going to be even more of a source of data, the Apple Watch, once the FDA gives it approval for sorts of things. But if your mom's a 1,000 miles away and you want to check your pulse and she's got an iWatch, guess what? You can right now. All right? That's ambient intelligence. That's combining data sources from different places to learn things about people. How many of y'all have Fitbits? How many of y'all had Fitbits two years ago? Did not. Oh, wow. Any nerd. Anyway, those things, those things came up really quickly, and people don't think twice about them now. And they're health monitors, and they're health monitors that share information. They share data. They send data out that people can use. There's going to be all kinds of wearables out there, all right? Just stuff we can't even imagine yet, made by Samsung or made by, let me go back, this guy actually just wrote a biography on, uh, on Tim Cook. That guy is smart. But really, the real reason for the Apple Watch from Apple's point of view is payments because Apple, is, Apple sees its future, a huge part of its future, as in payments and in the car because they really are going to build the car. Your money and your life are going to live on your wrist, all right? This is ambient intelligence. It just combines stuff from everywhere, it combines things from smart hospitals, technicians, your doctor, your nurse, an emergency thing if it comes and gets you, your assisted living home, robots in your home, on-body sensors, you're going to have robots in your home in assisted living centers. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, you're going to have monitors on your body with sort of tier two type devices that are going to keep track of you because we're running out of doctors so we're going to be able to take better care of people at a distance. It's like telemedicine on crack, basically. I mean, it's telemedicine taken out to its furthest degree, like how in 2001, a space odyssey. These are some ambient sensors that are used in smart environments right now. Most of the research in this is being done in assisted living centers in Europe, but you've got like, um, the one that's interesting to me are the smart tiles. Whereas, let's say you had somebody in an assisted living center and you, you track their movements on smart tiles during the day. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Well, let's say that they're covering, there's a certain weight on three smart tiles that hasn't been there before for, you know, two hours. What can you infer? Somebody fell down, all right? And you can help them that way, all right? So all these sensors, you can help people with different things. These are body sensors. There's actually clothing that, are, that has uh, body sensors on it. A lot of these are going to come through your watch or your bracelet or whatever it is, but it's all information that can be aggregated. And this ugly-ass chart, you never know I wrote a book on PowerPoint, but I did. But basically, all this is saying is you've got all this information that's being gathered in an assistant living center, and it, if it detects an anomaly, something's wrong, it can let the assisted center know, but it also could let everybody on that person's Twitter feed, their family Twitter feed know, all right? So you use existing technologies to do kind of very cool, cool things. What AML is, uh, AM, AMI is ambient intelligence. It takes the ubiquity of all these devices we have now and uses artificial intelligence to contextualize it to make sense out of it and use it for things that we can't use it for right now. This is how it works. It looks at an activity, it discovers a pattern, it looks for anomalies, and it makes a decision. Everything's okay, or maybe everything's not okay. Ambient intelligence is context aware, it's personalized, it becomes more personalized as time goes on because it gathers more data, it adapts to your behavior it's transparent, you know, people, nobody really looks at you if you're wearing a Fitbit now or if, if it's in your home, if you have motion detectors in your home, and it's going to be everywhere, and it all works by inference. 
it infers things from the data it has. It says, uh-oh, something might be wrong. And it, and it kind of does that by semantically coding things in the right way. And I got a tiny bit of time, so let me just show the importance of semantically organizing the information. If you're a Star Wars nerd, you couldn't tell me how Leia Organa is related to Bespin. And I'm a Star Wars nerd, right? Okay, if you code the information right, though, these are the gray stuff is field names. The stuff in color is data. So Leia Organa, data, was a passenger on, okay, that's a field name, or a semantic tag, the Millennium Falcon. Let's go over here, you can see it better. My laser tag is dying. Anyway, she's a passenger on, I'll walk over here and show you. <clears throat> she's a passenger on the Millennium Falcon, whose former owner was Lando Calrissian, whose data, whose home, semantic tag, was the Cloud City, whose location is the planet Bespin, all right? That's how you can make, and you can infer a relationship between Leia and uh, the planet Bespin, all right? What if the planet Bespin was Crohn's disease and Princess Leia was Alzheimer's, all right? And you were able to infer things between those two. That's when life gets very, very interesting. It's kind of what Netflix does to you. It watches, it tags the movies semantically that are in its database, watches what you watch, it compares it to other people, and makes an inference because it follows Metcalfe's law, which is a telecommunications law, which says the value of the network is the square of each new member that enters it. Somebody needs to Wikipedia that and make sure I said that right. But the more people in the network, the more value it has because you can infer things. Google flu trends turned out to be a valuable tool for a while because it could take two pieces of data. When you Google something, uh, Google knows where you Googled it from because of your IP address, and it knows what you Googled. So if you have a bunch of people in Minnesota all of a sudden Googling flu symptoms, and that's two pieces of data from each person. From Let's say, but thousands of people are Googling flu symptoms, and Google knows it's coming from Minnesota. What can you infer? Right, and it tracked almost perfectly the CDC's flu model until Google started doing the auto fill-in thing, which you can really tell somebody's personality if you get on their browser and just start typing in random words and see what Google fills in based on their past searches. <sighs> That's how you get to know somebody, is Google. But you can take better care of, of older folks with these devices by having devices around that do different things, make sure they took their medicine, accelerometers on their watch. If they go down too fast, you can see that they fall, and you can be alerted at home. On your iWatch, you can see what your mom's pulse is, all right? This allows us to take better care of older people. And this is a, an article that was written recently, learning, general, learning setting generalized activity models for smart spaces. This really applies to assisted living centers. This is a, a diagram of, um, of an assisted living center, and I'm just going to concentrate on one room, all right? And here is, oh, it works now. All right, here is the living room, here's the bedroom, and the red things are sensors, right? Here's the bathroom, here's the kitchen, all right? Well, what this system does is it knows that it has these types of tasks. These people have these types of tasks, and the motion detectors, if they're in the kitchen, it assumes they're cooking. And it, follow the, it follows them during the day and sets up behavioral patterns over time. That's ambient intelligence, all right? They know sometimes they go from the bed to the toilet and see when their bathing is red, when they're taking medicine is purple, when their cooking is yellow. Those are lots of different rooms, and that's a lots of, that on the left, is lots of different people's daily behaviors, normal behaviors modeled, all right? If it was mine, it would just say surf the internet all day long. There would be like one big black line because I feel as though that's basically all I do or play the guitar. But anyway, you can learn things about your residents and detect anomalies. If something's going on that's super out of the ordinary, a system can detect it through a series of algorithms. It learns when you're cooking, when you're relaxing. Do you relax after you cook? 
No, you generally eat after you cook. You assign a confidence value to that. You sleep after you relax, possibly. The sensors down here figure out what your daily behavior is, all right? And I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's in a second and show you why this is important. But it can look at your behavior, and if it detects you're smoking, there's devices now that will show you what you're going to look like in 30 years if you keep doing that behavior that it's noticing that you're doing, all right? Isn't that kind of creepy, weird, cool? I think it is. Um, one thing these things can also do, if let's say you're in an assisted living home and you have these motion detectors that are examining people's behavior, it can also learn the symptoms of the onset of Alzheimer's by examining simple tasks like, let's say, for instance, cooking. All right, there's normal rules to cooking. You retrieve the milk. If they retrieve the milk and then retrieve the measuring cup and then they use the measuring cup and they do it every time, that's a good thing. If they start kind of going off that, that's something that needs to be noticed. If they do things like they don't turn off the stove during part of their cooking thing, that's an error and it's detected. A, that's a, that's a burn error and can detect safety problems. But anomalous behavior, uh, basically as dementia develops, normal performance behavior decreases. So you can measure through these type things. This is being done in Europe. You can measure the onset of Alzheimer's by watching people's behavior in their homes over time using these sensors. It sounds kind of creepy, but also to me it sounds very useful, especially if you live away far away from your parents and you don't notice it as much as other people might notice it. And what you're looking for is this value PI. The higher the value PI, if you have zero failures and your successes over successes is one, equal to one, then it's great. But if you have 10 successes, seven successes, and uh, I'll make the math easy on me, seven failures, it's 10 divided by 14, 1.4. Oh, as the value goes higher, then you know that's things you need to look out for. In Alzheimer's wards, which I'm sure some of y'all have in, um, in your assisted care centers, they're using mostly bracelets and they follow people's behavior during the day so they can track where they, where they are and what they're doing in wards. And the time for nurses goes down. Their time spent on indirect tasks checking on people goes down. This was an experiment in Spain. And they found that the number of nurses it took to cover an Alzheimer's ward went down, all right, based upon so much of the other work being done by the data, plus people with Alzheimer's got into places they weren't supposed to be in less, all right? And it's gotten to the point where if they're wearing a bracelet that has an accelerometer, if they get someplace and fall down, the accelerometer detects the fall where they are and the nurses can come right to them and know where they are. And if they're carrying a tablet that has their EMR on it, their tablet gets updated with their information when they get to them. All right, this is ambient intelligence using all the information around. Plus, this is gonna be happening in hospitals very soon. When you go into a hospital, I talked to tons of hospital associations. Pretty soon in larger hospitals, you're getting a bracelet so that they can determine where you can and can't go. For elderly patients that live at home, you have a few monitors and maybe something you're wearing and you can learn a lot of things and people can be more comfortable there because they feel more secure. They think that somebody out there somewhere is, is watching them because there's less and less caregivers. The number of people over the age of 65 will increase by 101% by 2030. That's a rate of about 2.3% every year. During that same time, the number of family members who can provide support for them will increase by only 25%. All right, so that care has to come from somewhere. This is a Venn diagram of where care comes from right now, from the inside out, who cares for you as you get older. The first person is your spouse, all right, takes care of you. Uh, second closest is your daughter, 
third closest is you're not your son, it's your daughter-in-law. Moral to this chart, be nice to your daughter-in-law, all right? Because it matters that you're nice to her. And, and what's interesting is younger people are marrying less. My generation is still 65% married, so they have caregivers, but you can't have, if you're a millennial, you can't count 250 friends on Facebook as caregivers, I don't think, unless millennials work way different than I think they do, which I'm beginning to that they think they do because of this whole Tinder thing. The other thing is using devices as sensors and... Co- <laughs> she laughed at Tinder. She knows what it is. Do you have Tinder, ma'am? <laughs> swipe left on me. I'm no good. Just, just swipe left on me. Uh, using devices to watch after you because I compare living at my mom's in an assisted living home, and it's a fantastic one, and all her friends for the last 50 years lived down the hall from her. It's weird, but that doesn't always happen. I compare growing old to the difference between arriving home from the airport and no one there to meet you and arriving home from the airport and someone there to meet you. I mean, y'all know that feeling when you get back from a long trip to an airport by yourself. On a scale of 1 to 10, how much does that suck? 10, all the time. Yeah, it's just an awful way to live. My, actually, my old secretary used to, if I was away a lot, she would bring her kids to the airport to meet me just because she knew that it would make me happy to, see, to be met at the airport, you know. Loneliness is kind of a big deal for old people. Siri can cure part of that. If you ask Siri like stupid questions like, let me see if I have Siri on right now. You can ask Siri like dumb stuff. Let's see if it works. Oh, I don't have any service. Anyway, when you get bored, ask Siri what zero divided by zero is. She gives you a smart ass answer. There are certain things you can ask Siri where you get smart ass answers. And it's kind of fun to talk to Siri. If you tell Siri, set a timer for an hour, she goes, okay. And I have mine set to the Australian voice now, which is awesome. She goes, because when you call mom, it doesn't say calling mom. It goes, calling mum, which I think is great. But anyway, if you say, Siri, set the timer for an hour, she goes, okay, timer set for an hour. Don't worry, I won't forget. All right, that's a little bit conversational, weirdly kind of reassuring because it's kind of like, she's kind of talking to me. Did any of y'all have an Amazon Echo? That's going to be the first step in assisted living is Amazon Echoes in pretty much everybody's house because it can hear, it's a sensor that can hear the entire house and people can, a person can say, Alexa, play me every Montavani record. Do y'all remember Montavani? I hope not, because then you're really old. Or you can say, Siri, I need some help, and somebody will call and come get you because it can hear so well. I'm actually writing an API for that that takes that horrifying 72-button Comcast remote and hooks up to that to where you can say, Siri, turn on HGTV, and it'll do it, rather than trying to navigate that remote that I can't navigate. And that would be the only thing I would ever say to it because the only thing I ever watch is HGTV. Anyway, you can say, Alexa, how how warm is my mom's room if she's thousands of miles away? You can check on her. Is the dog nearby because he could have something on him? Change the channel to HGTV. People could also have companions. I'm sure you've seen Paro, the therapeutic little gray seal that has been, let me redline this, it's been found to reduce patient stress and their caregivers stimulates interaction, shown to have have a psychological effect on patients, improving their relaxation and moderation, improves their socialization. I used to take my yellow lab to the nursing home, which I guess you probably can't do anymore. I'm not sure. And old people just want something that's not afraid to touch them, you know, that's because touch is very important. And, you know, who's a golden retriever not going to touch? or a yellow lab. They'll touch everybody. It made everybody super happy. Did y'all see Robot and Frank? He lived alone and he had a robot that assisted him 
during his daily task. Big Hero 6. Did y'all see Big Hero 6? It was a, it was a robot that would assist somebody who had medical problems and it would run it would go around with asking and would ask questions say press which face how you feel right now and it would learn things from them and then adapt to the situation there was a movie called moon and when it could tell this guy was in a bad mood by his language or his body language it would put on the appropriate smiley or non-smiley face i think what's going to wind up in people's homes is something, a little robot, that's going to be a cross between a Roomba. Y'all know what Roombas are, right? Vacuums your house and then goes and sits someplace and recharges, and a Furby. All right? It's going to be a mashup between a Furby and a Roomba, and it unobtrusively is going to kind of follow you around, but it'll watch you. It'll watch your facial expressions. It'll see if you fall down. If you're in a room too long it'll go in that room and find out why you're in that room too long. It'll listen to you at night and see if it can detect sleep apnea patterns of breathing. All right, it's going to be very unobtrusive and anamorphically, is that the word? Anathomorphically. It's going to look friendly like Mickey Mouse. It won't look like a robot. What's the word I'm looking for? Anthropomorphically, I think is the word I'm looking for. But anyway, I think everybody's going to have one of these that's going to be gathering information about people in a very sort of unobtrusive way, and you're going to get used to it. And people won't mind because older folks, it has been proven, are quick adapters of technology. There's a Pew study that shows it. I don't have it on here. But in terms of money, the quickest people to adapt biometrics are the elderly because it saves them time and they don't have to type in little things. Older folks are not afraid of technology, and if technology, I know Mike, if technology is going to help them out, I think they're going to be the first ones on this, and the natural place for it to happen is in assisted living centers. A black swan is something that comes along and changes everything. I think the black swan in y'all's business over the next few years is going to be all the technology that's going to come in there and be used under ambient intelligence. It's going to go straight back to 2001, A Space Odyssey. Hal took care of Kier Dulay from when Kier Dulay was young to when Kier Dulay grew old. In the movie at the end, he grew old. And um, I think uh, he'll be doing the same for me. It'll either be Hal, a bracelet, or me. And yeah, that is Kier Dulay from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Thank you very much for your time and your kind attention.